Great. Cool. All right. We're rolling five, four, three, two, one. All right. Attila, thanks so much for joining me on the Hot Drinks podcast. How are you this evening? Uh, doing great. And uh, thanks for the invite. I've been enjoying the the ones that I've assisted so far. So I'm really feeling honored to be on here. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'm excited to chat. And, uh, you know, you've got so much field experience over the years. Uh, I can't wait to dive into your stories. But we always like to start off with our favorite hot drink. What What's your go-to or has been your go-to <laughs> hot drink over the years? Well, I, I could kind of guess given your Chilean experience, but uh, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> okay, well, if it's 3 a.m., and the tide has just invaded the tent, <laughs> and mate is definitely the drink of, of right. choice. All right. Uh, but I've I've gone through a transition. I used to, I I mean I'm still a hot cocoa guy. Don't get me wrong, mm. but uh, I spent a lot of time in in hot places in my last kind of <laughs> you know few years there doing a lot of expedition work, and I kind of got into the miso mm. salty drink at the end of the day on the Amazon or in Australia off the Drysdale. And wow. so that's kind of like elbowed its way in there. It's not a typical so. thing, but yeah, I just needed a little hot, salty injection at the end of the day. Yeah, that, that, that might, like, that, that's a new one for us here. Uh, so are, are you, is that, is that a powder? You got a bag of powder? Is it packets? How's that, how's that coming? Well, yeah, a lot of times it would come in these um, either, pa- uh, but like bigger packets, you know, okay. as you just get out a little chunk and mix it in there and, and to heat it up. Yeah, I know. It was a little atypical for me too, but well, I kind of got addicted to that in yeah. the hot the hot climates. But I'm still a hot cocoa guy, unless, like I said, it's a early morning tide has invaded your tent right. thing. And then then I'll go mate. Well, I'm surprised <laughs> you would even take the time to make something at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's but when you like decided you've you've kind of decided, all right, are we gonna just let this subside or do we need to move the tent? Right. So if we decided like, okay, just let it, it's only at the vestibule line, maybe a little, you know, and you're just waiting it out. Yeah. yeah. That, that's Mate was fired up a few times there. Right. Right. Emer- emergencies. <laughs> emergencies. That's right. Right. Awesome. Well, well let's jump right into it. Um, and, and here's some of, some of your best stories from, from your time leading with, uh, with Knowles and, and some other organizations. Um, so you got one here crossing the midriff islands. That sounds like yeah. a bit of an epic. Yeah, I mean, that was, um, that was an expedition we did. It was 1996, and I had just done my first season uh, in Patagonia, but I was back up. I'd worked a lot in Baja, Mexico, both um, with Knowles and before that guiding, and I had a couple of friends, uh, Bruce Smithhammer and Mo Richard, who you might yeah. You know. Yeah, I know both, both those guys, yeah. And we had been talking about it for a while. And you know how that goes. We're talking about it, talking about it. Fun. It's like, all right, well, I got the time. You got the time. We did all the, the basics, make it up on a, the back of a napkin. And there we went. We all had time. It was October 96. Um, I probably had about three weeks. The other guys were a little bit tighter on their schedule. So we got to ride up with logistics up to uh, Baya de los Angeles up there in the uh, you know, the Northern Baja state. And we got dropped off there. And the idea was that we were going to cross the Gulf of California. Um, but we weren't going to do the crossing, which I know some other folks have done, which is an incredible yeah. feat as well, just going straight across the Gulf, wow. you know, yeah. and we, we That's were curious about the Midriff Islands. You know, we'd always been looking out at them and different routes we'd all paddled. And all right. Just so paint a picture uh, for folks who are not familiar with that area yeah. where the, where the islands are. So if you're in the uh, Gulf of California, it's literally kind of right in the middle. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of the pinch point of separating the northern Gulf of California or Sea of Cortez from the south. Right. And because of that pinch, you know, there with three or four, there's, a, there's uh, various islands in there. The main ones probably were the, where we were, were San Lorenzo, San Esteban, which is the one right in the middle. And then a huge island off of the the mainland coast there, Isla Tiburon, uh, which right. means Shark Island in <laughs> Spanish, and that will come into play later. Right. And, <laughs> and and then we're going to cross over to Bayaquino. So it's it allows you to do the crossing in a series of hops in right. between first the you know Baja, then and and then over to the different islands, and then eventually a hop over to Bayaquino. So the the crossings were all probably about ten. Uh, to almost 20, probably a little bit shy of that. Wow. Uh, 
the other big deal there is that because of that pinch and, and the tidal movement of, of the ocean there, you get some pretty strong currents yeah, I can imagine. low and through that little pinch spot there. And um, so we had researched it and a lot of us had paddled on one side of the coast there, probably on the Baja side. And so we knew, we knew that side pretty well. And we'd always looked out at those islands and, and talked to some fishermen through there anyway. Mm -hmm. We got dropped off in Bay of LA and just sort of enjoyed our first day and got out and down the coast out and around Bay of LA, which has its own set of first islands there. And, and it's a big shark fishing spot there, uh, depending on the time of year. Right. So we pulled into our first camp and this was at uh, Francisquito. Um, so that's a, that's an area south of uh, south of Bay of LA a little bit. I can't remember the mileage at this point. It was our first day. We pulled in there and we saw an amazing amount of, I mean, we basically pulled into a shark fisherman's camp and just had all just a bunch of hammerheads. Apparently right. was one of the yeah, hammerheads are very popular in that area. Yeah. So, you know, it was just kind of littered with that. It was really obvious that it was a shark fisherman's camp. We're like, okay. And we had originally planned on going to San Lorenzo Island, which is sort of the next, it's kind of this long north to south island it would be the next logical jump there. But the way we started looking at another smaller island called Salsi Puedes, uh, the wind was blowing when we woke up. We were a little hesitant, you know, how uh, for anyone who's paddled there, you know, the Nortes at that time of year start mm -hmm. to kick in. You're kind of on the shoulder season there. And they were, it was blowing out of the north. So we decided to go for a shorter initial crossing to this tiny dot of an island called Salsi Puedes, which means, of course, leave if you can. And uh, mm -hmm. we got out paddling. The wind never filled out. Everything was feeling good. We kind of were making our, making our calls as we went about whether we were going to just use that as a passing by and go on to San Lorenzo. And we decided, no, we're going to go for Salsi Puedes and then we'll do another hop tomorrow. Hmm. And it worked out. Uh, no big deal. The winds kind of just stayed where they were, even backed off in the afternoon. We pulled into a small little slot of an island. And there was, a, there was probably a north and a south beach. We got into the a little north beach there, but it was easy enough to just kind of walk ourselves over to the south more protected cove. Uh, ran into a few uh, fishermen that were there. We're trying to get some local information for them. Like, okay, well, how are the currents here? Because the next right. move was kind of going to be the big move out to San Lorenzo. And if you look at the nautical, nautical charts, there's just kind of like this divot around that area where it just gets really deep. Hmm. So we were anticipating some pretty big currents. And we rested up full moon. You know, we're all like right. celebrating our our first <laughs> night out there in the middle of the Gulf, all that yeah. type of excitement as we're getting this um, uh, trip off. And <clears throat> so we got up early, you know, the, the whole Baja routine for sea kayakers. So anyone who's paddled out there knows right. you're getting up before, before, before sunrise and trying to get yourself on the water by that point. So you're just getting an advantage on the winds. And we just decided, you know what, let's just skip San Lorenzo and go for San Esteban because if you draw the line in a straight line at that point right. it looks like a, you're going to cut some mileage out of there instead of doing the sort of down south and then over sure so that's what we went for we decided yeah let's let's uh and of course at six o'clock in the morning the sea conditions are great so you're optimistic yeah, for the day yeah yeah it was you know the taza de leche as they say down there just really calm mm. beautiful conditions and great we got out paddling and we were probably pretty relaxed and maybe even a few relaxed <laughs> we'd we take our little floating breaks and like yeah this is great oh my gosh we're gonna get out to San stave on day two this is going to be incredible and as we continued to paddle we started to realize that we were getting set by the current uh... pretty 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 healthy set so I'm going to just fast forward because a lot did, of it was... Did you time your crossing with the currents at all? Or at that point, we were just kind of a little naive and, and going with the early morning? Well, we were timing it, but we were also trying to get our just as full daylight as as, as much as we could out there. Right. So we were like, you know what? More daylight is going to be better than trying to try and hit a, any any particular window. But the more we kept paddling, the more we realized that we were continually having to adjust our uh. angle 
to uh, to the currents. And so we fast forward, and here we are. It is now getting close to sunset, and we're getting no worried about getting swept south of San Esteban. Whoa. So, so the winds held off that day. You didn't. You didn't have bad winds. That day, nothing too big. They, they would sort of keep us honest past right. noon. They started to kind mm-hmm. of get a little bit there, uh, blowing a little bit, but nothing that was getting past ten. Nothing that was concerning us. But as we kept going, we started realizing that we were just on this, you know, escalator ride <laughs> that was just moving us. As we kept adjusting our angle, right, and we started first. We were heading towards the northwest corner. As we're reaching sunset, we're realizing we're struggling to get to the southwest corner of that island. You know, wow. and we're luckily there's a full moon that's going to be coming up soon. So, all right, we're we're we're, we're lucky right. we had well, visibility. Okay, well, we'll have visibility even at night. <laughs> if we miss the island, we could see the silhouette. We were getting close enough. Sun, you know, is down now at this point. And we're like. Wow. So we're all squinting, <laughs> heading towards this thing. And then we realize there's some kind of spit that's sticking out of the hmm. southwest corner. We're like, okay, yeah, that's there's a spit on one of these charts that we got. Just keep heading towards the spit. Keep Are you guys heading. exhausted at this point? You know, you're oh, probably, yeah. you're we're paddling all, for 12 we're hours. All, we're all like, you know, I mean, we're probably lamenting a little bit our, our kind of lackadaisical pace in the morning. And, sure. But either way, we, we, we were sure we had time because it was still under 20 nautical miles and we thought we had a, a pretty good lead on it. Anyway, we keep paddling, paddling. We're getting closer. So it's like, okay, we're, we're not going to miss the island. We're going to be able to get this spit. And then all of a sudden, as we're getting close, we start hearing the waves crashing <laughs> on whatever beach it was going to be. And then we just heard a massive rush of animals and it was a sea lion colony oh no way hanging out on that spit Uh, and you know vision and lack of light everything starts to get sort of a little bit skewed in the in the in the dusk and and we just heard these massive what sounded like massive sea lions yeah all basically kind of bum rushing the the water as i guess we had probably scared them by our presence being so close and so we had to kind of back off a little bit. We had to sort of back away from the, the, the beach a little bit. And we were able to finally get close enough that we could scout it out, realize that there was minimal break. And we, co- we coasted in there with sea lions still rushing off all around us into the water. Wow. No. And we were exhausted. By and that. it was a beach. I was just picturing it, your spit being like a rocky outcrop that you can't it, land. It was a rocky beach. It was, okay. it was okay. like, Rock, you know, like the thing, softball size, and yeah, so and not around. ideal, but but still doable for land. Not ideal. We didn't have too much surf, so we were able to cruise in there, and we just dragged our boats up on the shore, literally, and we all just bivied right there. I mean, this is probably I don't know nine thirty at p.m. Right. at this point, but everyone was exhausted and. We just crashed and, and sort of baby there. I'm sure we did some like small little one pot meal that right. somebody was up for. I believe that was Mo at that time. Yeah. And we woke up the following morning and we were camped right in the middle of a sea lion colony that had just made enough of an adjustment to us because the smell was oh, pretty. Man. That's probably what tipped us off that was sea lions when we first pulled <laughs> in there. It was like we got the smell a long right. time before we ever got anything else oh man i have i have a series of photos that we all took this is the 90s right so we weren't really even doing the digital camera thing at that point sure and the following morning each one of us just got a snorkel out and just laid in the water right off this beach and all the sea lions were around in the water and only the kids were just sort of diving right up and kind of you know just just kind of swimming right up to us and then taking a left or a right turn right wow. at the last second so and the cool. mom you know the the male was back there kind of just t- keeping a an eye on the whole scene making sure we were no big threat it was it was an amazing moment and i'm pretty sure some of those photos are still floating around in between myself yeah yeah i'd love to get those we uh we post them on our facebook page so if you, <laughs> if you can dig them up we'll, we'll post them when, when we yeah post this. yeah i'm sure i'll be able to get wow. some of them to you 
So that was it. That was the big move from Salsa Puentes to, to San Esteban. And we're all like, yes, we're in the middle. We are here. Uh, but no rest for the wicked. You know, it was, it, was, it was time to go. These guys had this little bit of a time presser for some contracts that they had coming up. Uh, I had a little more time. So we were back on the water the following day. And this time we're heading out uh, to uh, Isla Tiburon. And that was another pretty big crossing. We were trying to get there, camp, and then get around the corner to Bahia Aquino the following day. And that's when the wind kicked in. Wind kicked in with enough of a tidal current that, you know, with sea kayaking, uh, distance from shore, keeping your group together, all those things that we mm -hmm. like to, to keep uh, and handle as we're doing those risk management. So as the wind kicked up, and even more, it was, it was just a tide rip area that we basically paddled into. So uh, we kind of saw it and the wind was going, so it was masking the tide rip area. But at a certain point, we were just all in really big swells, probably about a 10 to 15, so nothing too, too bad, but starting to be significant enough there that we were concerned. And we all just were paddling our own paces and we got separated. Wow. The three of us. Uh, I remember keeping tracks of Bruce Smith hammer back over my shoulder a little bit. And I couldn't see Mo, but I was pretty sure that Bruce could. And we were all just knew we were, we were all heading to that point over there. Right. <laughs> you know, and we just got into all right, just stay focused. And once again, those the rip currents through there were yeah. really, really significant to the point of where everyone was, you know, bracing a little bit and a couple of swells coming through, uh -huh. coming through, our decks were getting washed, et cetera. And finally, after about an hour and a half of doing that, we, we, we got into the, the, the sort of lee of the island, the wind was dying down, and also the effects of that, of that tide rip were, we're, we're mellowing out and then i looked around it was sort of like you've just been on this treadmill for an hour mm -hmm. and a half and they were like oh yeah where is everyone else that i'm wow. paddling with and bruce and i had been keeping in touch with each other and so as i'm paddling down the south i could see him sort of paddling to me and we all kind of gave this big woohoo you know? <laughs> we like we made it through there and then we're both looking around and saying, well, where's Mo? Oh, <laughs> I don't man. know where Mo is. <laughs> so the two of us joined together and we started paddling out a little bit, trying to like scan the horizon. We still had a couple of hours of uh, daylight, so we, we, we weren't worried about that. But we finally caught Mo. It was probably in the next 15 to 20 minutes. And boy, was Mo gave us, <laughs> gave us a little bit of a tongue lashing <laughs> as we both realized we had totally bogus our, our, our safety setup of staying tight when we got into the rip currents and got into wow. our treadmill mode but everyone well, he was, was just a little further behind you he was a little further behind and out than us so he was right. still coming in when we were both in there he had been swept a little further south you know there was just the currents were, were i mean we were planning for him but they certainly kind of met you know they lived up to the reputation um and we got in there so once we got the little sitting in our kayaks debriefing and we still had a few hours we're like well let's just keep going you guys let's just <laughs> keep going i mean honestly bahia kino's right around the corner so let's get there and and we continued on and now we were more relaxed the wind was died down we were in the lee everything was fine we're just paddling along, paddling along shore and as we're paddling uh bruce says to me he's like attila he's like yeah like there's a uh, there's a shark fin behind you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I was like, okay, well we're just gonna keep paddling, right? We're all just gonna keep paddling. Like, yeah, we're just gonna keep paddling. And this shark fin, I think Bruce kept kept track of it for a while, uh, and it followed us for a while, tracking us, and then wow. left us alone, and we pulled into a camp and celebrated on Isla Tiburon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the last big crossing there yeah. of, the, of the midriffs. Following day we got in, no big deal, into Bayakino. We had a contact from Pres Prescott College. Hmm. And within literally after pulling in from to the beach within an hour and a half, not even in the next hour, they said, hey, we got somebody who's going there and then you can get the ferry. And 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 I just said goodbye to Mo and Bruce literally within an hour of pulling into the beach. Took off because they had a ride to get yeah. back. I'm like, 
well, I got time. I'm just going to paddle back. No way. <laughs> <laughs> so I hung out with this guy who was there, who was our contact. I can't remember the name of the guy was great. He sent us up to buy a Kino. Mm. I hung out with him that night. And the following day, I just bombed it out to San Esteban again. No way. And, 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 and spent a night out there. And as I was pulling in, this guy from Bayakino for this Prescott College guy hmm. was coming out in a ponga, the typical fishing boat around there. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? He's like, we're tracking whales. <laughs> like, You're tracking whales? I want to go. So we jumped. I jumped in the ponga. I was already camped on a beach. Oh, yeah. And uh, he pulled out and we saw, uh, uh, it looked like a fin back came up and said, all right, well, they take about 10 to 15 minutes. So they're going to be going this way. So let's track them. And we got to the anticipated spot of where they would come up again. And I just jumped in with a fair, with a <laughs> just sort of bobbing around the water with my mask and snorkel on. And sure enough, it just, I just saw this feedback come right in front of us. No way. And, 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 you know, <laughs> I'm just seeing this massive silhouette of a finback just circling around. It was incredible. One of those moments that you'll, you know, yeah. just bring with you for the rest of your life of hanging out really close to a, to a whale. And I got this really eerie feeling that I was being watched as I'm bobbing around there. Cause the, the boat was kind of going around and trying to track. It's like, Oh, I'll just bob here in the Gulf of <laughs> California while no big deal. Don't run over me when you come by. Yeah. And, and, and then I just, some, sometimes watching me and I turned around and there was a sea lion and, and, you know, this is really deep water. So I had yeah. no reference. It was just like green. And then this white, you know, it looked white. Just this white sea lion staring at me. It scared the heck out of me. I think, I'm pretty sure I like gagged on some water. And whatever, How know. far was the boat at this point? Away. Oh, it was a couple of minutes away. No way. <laughs> I'm like, hey. Don't forget uh, about me. But it was great. Yeah, it was an amazing, um, amazing moment there. Just hanging out with some finback whales in the middle of the, the midriffs and I I, uh, I got a pretty good northern northern or norte coming uh, coming my way the following day, I was, and I just I just did a straight shot. I kind of saw San Lorenzo again. I realized it was only a few more miles to the to the coast. I'm like I'm I'm going for it, and I yeah. just went. And it was it got to be probably 20 25 knots blowing. It was it was a full wow. norte by the time I was over. But I had gotten over. I'd gotten the, most of the crossing out of the way. Yeah. And, you know, there I am. I'm like, well, maybe I'm just going to go to Santa Rosalia today. And I did. I just kept going and pushing it to get to a beach north of there. And then I saw in the silhouette as the, the sun was fading, I saw a sharp silhouette right next to me. And I said, all right, Santa Rosalia can wait. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I bailed out and I just did the surf landing and, and camped out that night, whatever, north of Santa Rosalia. So it was incredible, yeah. incredible wow. time. <laughs> wow that's incredible wow that's an amazing trip i don't know anybody that's paddled up that area that's uh that sounds like a fun uh personal trip there yeah well it certainly was a nice improv i wasn't really planning on doing the second part on my own but you know it felt good and you know how that is sometimes it yeah it all worked out <laughs> it's nice you're not you're not used to having that freedom with uh when you have when you have students with you <laughs> it's like exactly you know let's I had just do this plenty of time on my hands yeah oh that's great wow do you think you'll get back there and do something like that again? Are you interested? God, in I don't doing know if that? I'll get if the next time I get around the mid I might be in a sailboat, but who yeah. knows? <laughs> but paddling and paddling with my girls along yeah. the Baja coast. Oh yeah, you bet. I'll be back. For sure. Yeah. I love that area. Love it. All right. Let's hear another. Uh, we've had a couple of stories. Well, we had Jim Chisholm talk about the Amazon and we had Sir Harvey, who was also on the same there. course where he yeah. shared a story and they both shared stories, but you've got your own. You weren't on their expedition. You've got your own stories from the Rio Roosevelt. Uh, yeah. You've been on yeah. that a few times. I think that definitely is, is, is worth a story. You know, if you have everyone's got their trips that are like those lifelong trips and yeah, I mean, I mean, think about it for all of us, you know, we all had a bunch of experience, you know, if you work for Knowles, you go up to Alaska, you go to these different places, you start to get your little repertoire, but it was, it was born out of a, a few beers around a, a, a sort of a Patagonia storm, you know, in Southern Patagonia, we're like, we should go somewhere warm and do a trip. <laughs> and, and so that became the, the impetus for going to the Amazon. Wow. Uh, Jim was obviously in on it. Um, a couple of other people, there was a few Brazilians on there, Fabio and Flavio. 
uh, they recruited a doctor who came along and has now turned into, of course, a lifelong friend. And then John Kempsey, who was another mm. Knowles staff, uh, a Brit who's also had plenty of experience out there. And um, so 2003, we, we were trying to figure out where to go. Brazil is not known for a lot of gradients. You know, if you get off the coast, you've kind of got to go either to the border with Colombia and Venezuela to get some high mountains or you're right there on the coast. But it also has a kind of north to south con, uh, convex shape there. So the Brazilian highlands are in the southern area. That's where the best ex- access is. And as we were looking around, we, we found this Rio Roosevelt, we're like Rio Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. And we started to look it up and historically there was already a story there because, you know, Teddy Roosevelt had lost his third presidential campaign and went down there to, to whatever, to, <laughs> to, to assuage his, his, his losses there in the presidential yeah. election. And it looked like there was a lot of rapids in there and we wanted to do something that was expeditionary where we got these alley pack canoes that were really lightweight so we could kind of transport them and just build them up there. Uh, we weren't going to be able to do a lot of serious technical light water, but that was fine. We were in there for the whole expeditionary aspect of it. And we saw that Sobek had run a trip with, the, mm. I believe it was the, the grandson of Teddy Roosevelt. And they had oh. been the ones that had been hired out to do it. And we were like, okay, that's it. We're going. And one of our, so Fabio Oliveira, who's longtime uh, Knowles mm-hmm. field instructor, he's also helped found Outward Bound Brazil. Um, so he was helping with a lot of the logistics of getting it together. And at so that this time, you're doing to just start just setting up. So this yeah, is a yeah, scouting yeah. trip to see if you could potentially do Knowles trips down in the future. This is the first, well, yeah. first I mean, time in there. Yeah, we had gotten improved for a Knowles program. And then after September 11th, it had got that, that, that had gone away. So we were like, well, we're just going to keep Brazil on Knowles' map. Right. And so we were like, let's go and paddle the Amazon because we all want to do that anyway. Right. <laughs> right. And there was a, I don't know, there was thousands of weeks, I don't know, thousands, hundreds of weeks of experience out there for sure. of that group that got together. And uh, as we researched it, there was a couple of things that were particular about it. One, it was in... Uh, uh, indigenous reserve area. Mm. So that's that's not an easy place to get uh, permission. You have to go through the right. federal agency um, that allows you to get permission. Then you usually also need, even if you have the federal permission, you'll, you're still going to need the local uh, indigenous mm. group's permission. Right. And the other complicating factor there was that in 2003, if you go and look up that time and the Roosevelt River, you find out, as we did, that it is the second largest untapped diamond reserve in the world. Oh, wow. And the, and so there was a big conflict around indigenous reserve, sometimes open it up for outside uh, kind of small scale miners to come in there and do that. And then sometimes closing down cultural differences, conflicts around all that different stuff mm. were going on. People had been killed. One of the stories that was told was of uh, uh, one of these wildcat miners they called the gutting betos there um sort of you know disrespecting a local indigenous chief and he was taken out in a body bag with a bunch of arrows in his chest afterwards i mean that was the the wow. level of the conflict that was going on there but you know fabio was able to get uh, us permission to get in there all that kind of stuff uh we were searched by the federal police as we were waiting to get in there. The guy that was the contact said, no, uh, said no problem. And then we got in there and of course we had problems. So like, he doesn't speak for us. He is no one to be giving you permission. And this is us waking up in the reserve right on the river's edge with, you know, nine or 10 indigenous people just saying, uh, who are you guys? And what are you doing here? And we're like, um, we talked to, you know, Joel and Joel said it was fine and got us this permission. They're like, Joel doesn't give the final word here. Okay. Uh, and we negotiated and negotiated. And after a lot of kind of bravado and talking around, they they're speaking realized, Portuguese. The, the, this is Portuguese. Yeah. And this is Portuguese as their second language. That's I mean, what I was going to say. Cause a lot of times those tribes don't even speak that well. A lot of Portuguese. times that, that area was opened up in the late okay. 1960s. So, right. I mean, it's just even the time span and, 
you know, one of the things that I, uh, I, you know, it was almost a blessing for me is that as we scattered out the Amazon basin and found out areas to go, we were dealing a lot and, 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 and having to negotiate with the different indigenous peoples of these areas. And that was an incredible experience in itself Yeah, because imagine. Portuguese was definitely their second language. In some cases, they like rarely saw people that were not living on that, uh, that, that specific indigenous area. So that was an incredible, that was an incredible thing all on its own. They finally said, look, you can go down, but beware. There are some uncontacted uncon indigenous peoples that are there. They might give you problems because we can't speak for them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We're like, okay, we kind of thought it was a scare tactic and right. we took off. And they, they, they had no idea that you were doing this as a scouting trip for a potential, like coming no, back every they, year. Yeah. That, that, that number one, that, and, and, and that was like, that was our background. That's what we wanted. But for this trip particularly, right. we were just excited to be there on our Low own. expectations. <laughs> yeah. Well, all of us, I mean, you know, Jim, you know, he's Canadian paddled all over the place, all over the world. Uh, none of us had, had ever done any camping or anything in the Amazon. So right. it was a new experience for all of us. And, and we definitely done our research, but as we're getting on, it's Coca-Cola water, you know, sort of this tannic yeah. acid, uh, white water. So it wasn't sediment laden, but it was just, it was just brown <laughs> white water. It was really a bizarre contrast. And they're like, Don't look out for the electric eels. We're like, yeah, I think we, <laughs> You guys know about the electric eels, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I read up about them. I'm sure we'll be fine. Anyway, we, we got on the whitewater and it was, our guide was Teddy Roosevelt's book about this expedition. And Teddy Roosevelt has his, obviously is a, you know, a character and famous character, but I, I would not call him the best writer <laughs> in the world. So we're like going through this and trying to figure out where we were. So we started a little further down and uh, the first night camping, we're out there and we're hanging out and Fabio and I are on a beach and we've all set up our camps and we're just sort of overwhelmed by the fact that we're actually in the Amazon camping mm -hmm. and going down this river. And, um, and then we hear this like thwack, 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 thwack. I, went, I, don't, I don't know what that is. We keep talking, keep talking. And all of a sudden, John Kempsey comes out of the brush, totally disheveled, his, hand, <laughs> his hat slightly askance his new MSR bug tent that he had bought just for the occasion and his fly swatter that we all just basically taunted him for buying minutes before we like set out to get to the, to the, to the put in. We're like, what are you buying a fly swatter for? <laughs> I will send you a picture of the amount of like, you know, insecticides, repellents, bug net that we had. We were way over <laughs> Right. overboard well, with that's, all that that's a good thing, we just I didn't know we just had no yeah. idea and john's like ants the ants you know <laughs> yeah he was like had this kind of like manic look in his eyes oh, were like no. yes. and we look at his tent and it's all eaten up with all these little holes everywhere <sighs> and i mean if you think about it all of us if we think about the amazon and camp in the amazon you think bugs yeah. and snakes, whatever you're going to put in your, like, your mythic Spons. mind's image of, of anything that's like the yeah. Amazon. But my, the thing that gave me assurance the whole time was like, look, if we can just zip up the tent at night and we'll have our hours of peace right. and then we'll zip it back out right. and we'll go up there the following day. Can't be that I bad. I calculated that the insects would be eating our protection. <laughs> right. So that's those so leaf see, cutters with that... <laughs> Well, that's what we thought was leaf cutters. And then, and then we realized that night as we all did not sleep, right? John was able to, I mean, there was, there was, they, they were, they were literally pea sized heads to what I thought we thought were leaf cutters. But even when you killed them and then maybe the body was detached, those heads were on there with their mandibles and you had to pluck them off afterwards. <laughs> and there was at least quartered silver dollar to even bigger holes all over his tent oh, he had just had to abandon it and thwack them with his fly swatter enough to get him out of there i sprayed every single string of my military hammock that we'd bought there you know with insecticides so that they would not get under me and i woke up in the middle of the night to an army ant column that was going that was migrating through our campsite. No way. And these army ants are like, I don't know how many thousands. Yeah. They're colonies that just move from one spot to the other and they will take out any small creature in their way. 
And that is what we ended up having run into that first night. Wow. Like, this Welcome. is night number one. <laughs> what is this going to be like? <laughs> oh, you know, it was crazy. And honestly, in the end, one of the big insights was like, don't mess with the ants. If you run up to a camp and you see all these little leaf cutter trails, just go somewhere else. Because yeah. that became a plague. Anytime we decided to camp near leaf cutters, man, we were paying for it with holes in our tents, holes in our clothes, whatever, <laughs> whatever we were dealing with. And so there were spaces where they, where they weren't they weren't everywhere all the time. Yeah, yeah, there were. And, and, and we started, you know, and that's kind of, what you do as you go down there, you start to figure out, mm. okay, well, what are the things that we have to, to get away from? And the other big insight was the bees. Mm. The bees was a big insight. Um, you know, the, the, you can blame uh, Brazilians for the killer bees. You know, it was a Sao Paulo beekeeper back in the 50s that un- inadvertently left open an Africanized bee colony uh, okay. in Sao Paulo that they were experimenting with and they all escaped out and now they're up in North America as well. Anyway, we That's ran into them all the time in our trip. And, you know, bee camps were probably the most disconcerting because you really didn't ha- have anything you could do beyond just try and kind of zen out the fact that there was about 10 to 20 to 30 bees on you licking your sweat, just wanted the salt. They weren't doing anything to you. But if you kind of moved inadvertently or thrust against one of them then you got a zap and you were stung mm. and there were still 20 other bees on there and they start releasing these pheromones that if you, you just have to be calm <laughs> this like, is why you're eating and just hanging out wherever if it was a bee camp they would just swarm around you and we started to just we had we had a a thelma fly that was adapted to have bug netting but even then, if we didn't like tamp it down with sand around the ground area, it was it was hard to maintain. And so whenever we were in a bee camp, you know, at a certain point, we would all just retreat into our, our respective shelters and and wait it out. Because, you know, sun goes down, bees are gone. Right. <laughs> so wow. that that became a really a big insight. And I, I remember at one point saying, well, you know, that whole bee stinger thing, I'm just going to see what happens. That was such a bad idea. I saw this bee stinger with the, the venom gland totally intact. And I was just like, I'm just going to let it pump its venom in there for a while. Boy, that was dumb. I mean, my, the next day I woke up with this, you know, looked like, I don't know, some anything you would get in a deli loaf of something oh, instead no. of my arm. It was totally, it's totally swollen. swollen. Wow. It was just from the amount of bee venom that I had let kind of get pumped in there. And that was, that was like, that was almost sort of the trip in itself with, the first week was just us discovering every day what it meant to be camping in the Amazon and trying to tweak our little systems and figure out what worked and what was overkill and what we really didn't need. And, and that was, that was, it was illuminating <laughs> for us. And we were in class four whitewater. I mean, it was just wow. class three and four oh, whitewater. So we couldn't run a lot of the stuff with, we had loaded boats. We were planning yeah. on being out there for a month, you know, yeah. and, Loaded like, canvas boats. Yeah, loaded canvas boats. Exactly. Not, not stuff you're going to confidently run class right. three, four white water in, yeah. et cetera. Which yeah. meant that we had to go the forest route or portage or line or a combination of both. And, you know, that, that had its own <laughs> wisdom right. that we learned. I mean, there was a time, I remember we were portaging one canoe and we just brushed against one of these uh, trees that there's classic nest for for these stinging ants oh. and the minute you make a connection with that the vibration will just send a warning message to the ants nest and they just swarm out to, uh, right to defend their nest right and and you are what they're defending against <laughs> so we're like carrying this co- canoe over our shoulder and all of a sudden we're abandoning the canoe as we're all jumping in the water just to get the, the ants off of us it was a it was a big eye opener. Wow! You know? Did you ever talk to any of the local Indian Indian indigenous groups and ask them like, "Hey, what? How do you guys manage these bees or ants?" Okay, so that, that's a classic question. Uh, not on the, we didn't see anybody. I mean, literally yeah. after we left the first village, we didn't see anybody for I don't know uh, over a week and a half. Oh yeah, we were. Uh, no one goes down there where we were going. 
Um, it's not where they're, they're, they were doing all of them. Mining was more upstream. You need some canoe skills to be able to navigate that water, right. et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, as generations past wasn't kind of in their uh, repertoire as much anymore. Um, so we were just, just trying to get through these, and we were, uh, these rapids and it was taking us all day to sometimes just do one rapid wow. or, or, or to get through, uh, the areas. There. And this is with a group of skilled paddlers. This is not and this is, know, yeah, students. This is, yeah. I mean, we had two guys that we were training up a little bit. There was a doctor that came along that was going to be there for our first two weeks, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was slow going and we started to get worried because we had budgeted to be a lot further down and mm. you know it was day five or six and we were still struggling through this top part with all with all the the rapids and everything um we finally got through finally started to make a little bit more time as we got through the worst of the technical section and 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 we got to this one shelf camp and i, I, I have to mention this just because it was us reading teddy roosevelt's accounts trying to figure where we're at, where we were. We had some really, you know, what were they? One to 100,000, no, they were one to 250,000 mm -hmm. scale maps that were, that was our, that was our river map. Yeah. And so we kind of, you know, measured all out like, no, I think we're still here. I mean, I think we're still before that confluence, da, 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 da. Yeah. And then finally we got a beat on it where it's like, it, it, there was petroglyphs in this rock shelf and, and that helped us because Teddy Roosevelt had documented that same mm. place. So we figured out like, no, this is exactly where we are here. Are the petroglyphs, perfect. At least we know where we are. And it's how a good feeling, more. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, was a little, it was a little rough there for a while as far as how much we were getting headway or not, really. Yeah. And it was also the night where there was a lunar eclipse. So it was just oh, this wow. bizarre lineup of different events. As we got into that more open water and more volume started to turn into there, it became something that we just started to do. In, in all told, we did a 650K wow. and the, this, this first confluence started to change the scale of what we were dealing with. It became more wide open channels. You could sometimes have five to six different lines down the mm -hmm. same rapid because it became a more braided, almost like you're going over a channel and that just cut through this really uh, the sandstone rock that was making these rapids in the end. And it gave you these different options. But if you went one way, it was going to be hard to try and go back and get to the other side. You kind of committed yourself at a certain point, depending on where you were. Right. And, uh, but we started to make more headway. We had to get to this one airstrip to get our buddy who was, uh, who was a doctor out, uh, which we did. It was a big deal. We also saw one of these massive catfish at this place it was what i don't know it was over 100 pounder the one that we wow. saw yeah just kept getting all these you know just different fauna i mean i remember one day we were looking we were on this kind of shelf camp and there was these little little channels of water that were coming through the rock shelf that we were on because it was really right about that same level as the shelf and we were looking at this leaf and then all of a sudden the leaf came out of the water and hopped away it was a frog that has an adapt adaptation and it looks just like the leaf floating in the water no way. That's i so mean cool. just incredible little insights like that you know seeing a bunch of monkeys going through the canopy mm. incredible stuff like that we were we were practicing uh literally practicing with some of the guys who had l l less experience uh throw bags and doing some basic river mm. rescue and all of a sudden a giant banded anteater washed down through our little training session so there was like this tube head coming out that as we're about to throw we're like that's an anteater and then it washed up onto wasp swam up into the other shore no brushed itself off Whoa. and then just walked away into the not into interested the, in you guys at all the rainforest. <laughs> just like yeah yeah whatever <laughs> it's probably the first time you'd seen an anteater in the wild yeah Completely. That's so neat. So incredible, incredible experiences like that. Um, as we continued to go down, we started to want to make more miles. So we did a few night floats when we realized mm -hmm. it was a little bit more calm and we would lash our canoes together, start brewing up the coffee. And everyone was trying to get some sleep. Uh, you know, I was impressed that the Brazilians were in there like Fabio and Flavio. 
were just snoring away in the bilge water in the bottom of these canoes. I'm like, <laughs> how are you guys even sleeping, man? I did not sleep that night. You know, I just like started to brew yeah, up right. coffee at a certain point. I'm like, all right. I'll just well, get it I, I love the quote that says the most comfortable bed is fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, wow. that was pretty much it. Yeah, incredible. Um, and as we kept going, we started to see uh, there was one fishing lodge as we got down mm. halfway down the river, you know, that we had no idea was there. And, and these people were amazing. And they gave us a hot meal and a cold beer, mm. which after two and a half weeks in the Amazon wow. basin was, you know, was sort of an amazing thing at that point. And they also started giving us different information on some mm. of the rapids coming up and what they were going to look like and and so there was a there was a middle stretch of a few hundred k that we did that it, it, we just started to make more miles and, and we got more confident like yeah yeah we're going to get there mm. we were trying to get to the end at the trans amazonica highway because that was really the next excuse me was the next pickup there was a, there was no other road access until that point mm. after we dropped this buddy of ours off and uh and we did you know we got there uh, after running some pretty big rapids to the end and, and getting, uh, getting split up, there was one last rapid there where everyone else went left. And I was like, you know, John, I was paddling with John Kempsey at that time. I'm like, I think the center looks really good. And it was such a bad idea. The center. <laughs> we got there and it was just like this big double drop off staircase class four that we were not running in a, in a canoe, <laughs> a canoe and, but we were kind of past the point of no return. And, oh no. So I'm like, John, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to swim across <laughs> that channel <laughs> to that eddy. <laughs> and then I'm going to throw you a throwback. <laughs> and, and I'm going to zip over the canoe over to here. And then you're going to swim over. So great. That's the plan. Got it. Good. So I was able to get over to the eddy. Got him the throwback. I zipped over the canoe. I'm like, okay, John, I got a throwback. Go for it. <laughs> And John just started getting there, but he was swimming in a PFD and he didn't have a lot of experience swimming in a PFD in white water. And he was just getting flushed. Oh no. I'm like, John, go back. <laughs> Zip. You know, and the, luckily I got, I, I got lucky with my throw and, and he grabbed oh, it. Man. I got him in there. And then we did a little, we just did a lot of ferrying that day and got over to the other side. And you're like, yeah, you guys left side was a good call. <laughs> <laughs> man that, that's what's running a river without any uh information's like like you get into those yeah it, it was it was amazing it was fantastic it was a highlight uh till this day of, for me as far as river trips go mm. and, and all so, those guys were all kind of like bonded from that trip yeah i bet <clears throat> can you just pop the camera up a little higher you, yeah sorry, your camera sorry, got bumped sorry. i think you're yeah, chopping your head off there that's cool yeah. um so even after all the challenges on that trip, you were kind of like, yeah, Knowles, this is perfect. Yeah, bring students down. <laughs> or did you guys, was it like, was it kind of a, a debate no, about it? it? Yeah, there was, it was like, okay, that was amazing. Right. But we're not doing the Roosevelt River for a, for a Knowles program. <laughs> That's like not happening. Um, uh, since then, you know, they've, they, there's a road that has gotten improved that gets you halfway down. And so Outward Bound Brazil has actually taken, basically inherited the Knowles Amazon program. As well. uh. But we started to look at other tributaries because this is all the Southern Amazon. So it's all uh, South to North flowing rivers that are coming out of, there's three types of rivers, right? And, and so these were all clear water rivers. So really clear, crystalline uh, water quality, amazing. And so we ended up doing the Aripona River, which is where the Roosevelt joins into. Oh, okay. And that's the first river we did. With, oh, okay. With so that, so you don't do that section that you guys did with, with students? No, especially that top section. We yeah. I mean, I'd love to go back, <clears throat> never gone back right. uh, because of so many difficulties in getting in there. Uh, just, a, 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 just a side note, a year later after our expedition, a native indigenous group the last eight members of its kind of a linguistic group that is will will no have no more uh, you know inheritors because the generation is dying off came out in that area between the Aripona and the Roosevelt. So that whole story that we thought was kind of a scare tactic from the, the indigenous mm -hmm. people that met us at the put in was actually 
for real. It was a non-contacted group that had been living in that area for whatever wow. the last decades were. Yeah. Um, so we just kept going east, and we started running the Aripuanã River, which we did as an exploratory trip on the first knolls. Yeah. Of course, it was we wow. had not scouted it. We knew the logistics, but we had yeah. not scouted it. And also the Zerdawena River, which is the one that became it's the war where Jim had his famous right. Jaguar encounter at this point. Right. Uh, etc. And it was turned into a national park while we were still scouting that area. Oh, great. Yeah. Wow. Sounds like a fantastic area. Incredible. I spent a little bit of time in the Amazon, in, in the Ecuador Amazon, but oh, uh, but not, 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 not on an expedition like that. I was, <laughs> I was a bit more taken care of. I did get to see some, some pretty, in, you know, remote indigenous tribes, but it's, a, yeah, it's a fascinating area. Oh, fascinating area. And, and so diverse. I mean, you yeah. can just go to a different area and you're going to see totally different wildlife, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, yeah, it killed me when I was there. I was living with a tribe for about three or four days and oh, wow. we couldn't speak. You know, I like my Spanish is broken and their Spanish was broken. And, um, you know, they had their indigenous language. And I was like, I've got to come back here with someone that knows this because, you know, we were just doing the sign language. But I was like, I have so many questions. Well, I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent for your earlier question, which was about, you know, how did the indigenous people deal with all these different mm you know, the, the bugs and everything. And, and when we were on the Jordawena River in our first time, we went down there and you are at a certain point on river right, it turns into a really large, really interesting uh, indigenous group down there, the Munduruku, who I have so much uh, respect for and they're an amazing uh, people there. They're kind of the original head shrinkers if you go back and, and look at the, the, some of the different practices that were going right. on. Uh, pre and, and during the initial European contact, but we asked them as we pulled up and they were in all the traditional buildings. A lot of them uh, had basically more traditional clothes and we found somebody who could speak Portuguese and mm. we asked them at a certain point, like, Hey, what, what do you guys do about all this? And we had this kind of like a little, almost, almost like fancy idea that, Oh, they've solved it all. And they'll have this secret, tree sap that they'll put on there and that'll just you know and that's what we want to know and they're like oh tell us about it <laughs> they are such a nuisance we don't know what to do we just like use the smoke and oh they're just such a pain <laughs> like, no way yeah not even people who have lived there historically for centuries right can really deal past a certain point yeah with, with, the, with the bugs and wow. that was a good insight for us like okay <laughs> yeah yeah, it's like taking someone from Florida to the Arctic in Canada and asking one of the villagers up there how they deal with the cold. They're like, it's like the cold sucks. We spend our time indoors if we can. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's finish it off with your kind of last okay. story here. Um, uh, a near drowning on the bio bio. Yeah, How's so the they like pronounce the bio bio down there. Bio. It, it, okay. you, you and know, this is in Chile. Yeah, this is in Chile, and and uh, you know I went down there in uh, '95 and started working for Knowles, and of course I was really big into whitewater kayaking at the time, and and this is another story with Jim, of course, and Chisholm was my paddling partner down there during that. That time. must have been early days for Knowles Patagonia. Yeah, it was '95, so that was whatever. Those were the first five years there, okay. so wow. not a lot of people were moving through there. Uh, mm -hmm. Jim and I were both, you know, that was my first year. I was so you know, ecstatic, as you know, how it's hard to get down there as a yeah. field instructor. And uh, in, in those days, maybe even a little bit more. Sure. And uh, anyway, we, we paddled once and we had a great time. Some of the the, the, the BOBO had already been uh, flooded out. So there's a, a few classic rapids that had already been flooded out. But we were going to do this with a few other friends, Brad Sautel, Reed McCullough, myself and Jim. And we wanted to do it big. So we did a multi-day trip on the BOBO. So we just went way up to the towards the headwaters, jumped on there. And the first few days are class two, three. But on the map, uh and albeit this is like a road map. Okay. <laughs> so this is <laughs> how we were rolling, right? So it was like a road map. So on there there was marked a few different areas. And this is the the northern reach, uh northern reach yes of the Mapuche, another indigenous, probably the most uh uh, unified and still to this day intact indigenous group in Chile, the Mapuche. And there was a few villages marked there. So we were doing a multi-day trip, but we don't want to pack our kayaks too heavy. So we said, well, we can always pick up some food at these places. And so our first few days were fine. We're floating down there. 
and two days of camping out and the same thing like here we are in the bobo this is amazing how great and then it started to rain and we're like well we're getting short of supplies let's let's pull into this one town and 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 get some resupplies before we go into the big canyon where all the big rapids are mm. so you're in and whitewater boats with all your gear so we're in uh, yeah whitewater kayaks i'm sure there was dancers on this one it was still uh, yeah. you know dancers. those are the shorties yeah yeah it was it was some of the old old school boats yeah uh we were shoving our gear in there in the back and you know had one msr stove international and however many much fuel we had and sure it was summertime there in chile and we got to this supposed village and there was nothing there there was no food. There was no village. If the oh, village no. was up there, it was way out somewhere where we couldn't get to it. <laughs> and at this point we're running low enough and, you know, it was kind of drizzling. We're like, you know what, let's just run it and get to our cars a little early and then we'll go out for a big dinner. Yay. That sounds like a great idea. What a bad idea that was. <laughs> so we get down to the bigger rapids and we're running on lost yak and lava south and we get out to lava south which is a big old just big granite canyon sized rapids um well up, up canada you all got a lot of big <laughs> volume river like that but that's kind of a reference especially for the u.s folks mm -hmm. um and i had run it before and i'm feeling pretty good about it. it it's kind of messy in the beginning you get your line and then it all kind of just funnels down to a really big hole that you want to miss on river left and you're you know you kind of weaved in amongst a few other pour overs before then so you kind of hit the right side of the center tongue and you'll be okay did you have Lots much beta on this on, on this canyon well like you i said i'd run it once before okay. you know but we just done a one day me and jim had, and jim probably done it a couple of times right we're there with what two other folks that were with us that hadn't seen it at all so we were pulled off on river, river left and that's fine i'm like you know what you guys I got this. I had a great run last time. I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll run down, you know, overconfidence. Anyway, do you want us to set safety? Oh no, don't worry about it. I got it. Bad idea. Cause it's a really long rapid. There's, there's like two to 300, you know, meters of oh, wow. worth of from where you're putting in to where you're getting out. Um, probably more like the 200 meter line. It just felt longer that time because yeah. it really kind of flushes into a wall and then there's this amazing feeder eddy that you never want to go into, or it just flushes into the next rapid with a little bit of a preview. Of course, I missed my line. I got in the roll. Uh, I, I got it. I got in the hole. I got pummeled, came out uh. and held onto my boat. And I'm like, oh, this wasn't a planned <laughs> one. And as I look up, I'm just flushing into this big pillow that's going into the wall. Hold on to my boat, hold on to my paddle. I got everything. And I go under. And I go under and I can feel like the kayak is way up above me still stand up there and i'm holding on i come out again i've lost the kayak briefly and i look and i'm in that feeder eddy that i did not want to be in because it's just all walled out there's nowhere to get out except right. for this one little shelf and then a tiny crack in the in the rock wall that you can kind of you know kind of shimmy out of and 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 i try to grab it and I, then you kind of had this surge because it was a really active surge eddy and I lost it and I got flushed into the top part, which was its own little feeder eddy within a feeder eddy. <laughs> and I, I don't know how long I spent there. Literally, I spent, you know, it's like those things where it's, I swear I was in there 10 minutes and it was right. probably in there about four to five minutes. Wow. And I remember just getting flushed. I would get onto the eddy line. I was like, don't let go of your boat. Yeah. I would hold onto my boat. I would get pulled down. You know, on that eddy line, I come you're just back. getting circulated. I'm just getting circulated in the eddy, and at a certain point, and it turned out to be my luck. I looked up and I just saw that they were still looking downstream, like nobody had got, <laughs> come down yet because they couldn't see me. Right. Like, oh, I get it. I'm on my own right now. <laughs> so after getting circulated a, a few times. And, you know, it was cold and I was not dressed for the water temp and, you know, those mm. mistakes we make and how you, you start to see all the small things that you do and how they all, all add up. Sure. I had no food. It'd been a rainy day. I was dressed for, barely dressed for the outside air temp, not at all dressed for swimming, just thin polypro base layer and my dry mm. top. And I was starting to feel it. And to the point where I was riding my own uh, obituary in my head and you know, no American Whitewater magazine. I'm like, 
my friend, that is not the kind of messaging you need right now. <laughs> you know? wow. And I got flushed back up in there and I got yanked down and I, I was like, count it, count it, count it. And I, I counted seven seconds. I lost the kayak. I came back up and I had been flushed out of the top feeder and I was going right back into that pillow uh, where it flushes into the wall and sends you back in the eddy where it flushes you downstream. And if I had been flushed right, I don't know if I would have made that because I was pretty bad at that point. But I got flushed left and I saw that little micro ledge that I'd seen at the very beginning of my swim. And I said, man, it is now or never Whoa. go, you know, and and I like swam hard. I got on there. I'm grabbing on with my fingernails and and I held on after the surge. And so I got my elbows up in there. And it surged again. And I was like, no, and I wedged my body into this little crevasse. At that point, Jim Chisholm was coming down. I was like, hey, I'm going to throw you back. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I don't think I could get a word out. I can't out even grab onto a bag at this point. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and so Jim was able to, to help me out afterwards. Uh, I was definitely wiped out uh, physically, probably a little bit uh, emotionally at that point. It was a, it was a big swim. Uh, a buddy had to actually chase my kayak at that point, uh, uh, Reed McCullough, who had started the Knowles, helped start the Knowles Yukon program later. And at a certain point, we're like, well, we can camp out here. I'm like, you guys, I'll get back in the boat. Let's go back down. It's less than a mile to take out. There's one, there's two more class fours. I could do it. I can always walk. I got in, dropped in with people in front and behind me for the next rapid. And of course I went over right away. Oh no. Yeah, you said yeah, nothing but, left. Yeah. I had nothing left, but I got my role. We got through the next few rapids. I got out of there. And I'll tell you, that was probably the worst swim of my entire wow. career as a whitewater boater. Yeah. Uh, where you kind of feel like, yeah, that was, that was too close for comfort. <laughs> One of those. That's incredible. Yeah. It did, was, it was, did it was, you ever go back? Uh, I never went back to the BOBO. Uh, partially because by the time that I was, uh, anyway, by the time I could have gotten back there, the other part had already started to get unfortunately flooded from, mm. from another dam project uh, there. So it was almost like a send off to right. the BOBO. It was and, never quite the same anyway. And it was never quite the same. And, and I will always remember the BOBO. <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> yeah, amazing. So, and how did that affect you? Like in your future paddling, whether it was with students I or on you your that, own? Yeah. You know, did you scale uh, back for a couple of years or did it take a while to get back in it? I did. I did. I, I, I paddled a lot in the Fuda, Fuda Lafu afterwards, mm. which is, you know, that level or probably a little bit even, even harder. Um, and, uh, you know, I ran everything on Fuda once and then I kind of retired to just the bridge mm. to bridge, the lower section down there, which is where uh, Jim and, and myself have some land. And, but I, it, it was, it, as Knowles has given more attention to psychological first aid and stress injuries, Mm. I went back and plumbed through that and I realized that, you know, there was definitely the, the making for a stress injury that started there. I, I did a, a, a river rescue training later where I was a drowning patient that I was simulating, mm. but I went back then. Oh, I, yeah. You know, oh yeah. The, the people were like, Oh, I told that was such a convincing uh, drowning patient. I'm like, I was not acting. I was literally right back in that, in that moment there. So, it started, it was a good uh, revelation for me about stress injuries and how they, how they work in our, in our yeah. like emotional, physical bodies and how we store that stuff and how you really need to process it to, to move on. And yeah. it took me a while to, to figure that out. So yeah, that, that left us market a lot of different ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, you know, these are many years later, remembering it in that detail is incredible. Oh, yeah. You bet. Did Knowles ever do much scouting or I know they don't do any whitewater program down there. Like I know there's a bunch of rivers, but was that ever an opportunity or a possibility to do a whitewater program for students? Well, I mean, we did the canoe expedition program that, mm -hmm. that was there for nine years. Um, we certainly thought about whitewater uh, stuff, but it never, the logistics behind it, the gear wasn't easy to get down there. And so it just, it became a, didn't really become a viable option while we were down there. Right. I, did, I ended up doing a nature conservancy um, uh, expedition down there for basically for dams in, in the Zerdawena River mm. for dam protection and river conservation. So I was uh, on the Zerdawena River. I was actually able to paddle all the stuff I've been looking at for so long, doing portages and linings and all that. Mm. But Knowles as a program never, never got yeah. that whitewater program going. 
Right on. Uh, unfortunately, because there's some amazing whitewater. It's just hard to get to down there. Yeah. Yeah, it's still, still a logistical. Yeah, and it is pretty gear intensive. Challenge, yeah. Program. Wow. So that was the big one as far as, uh, yeah, know, yeah. Well, things that left the mark. <laughs> glad you made it out of that. Yeah. I'm sure you're a bit more sensitive, uh, to your students on your next course after that one. Oh, yeah, you management. Bet. You bet. You bet. The, the heightened sense of awareness was increased. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Right on. Wow. That's incredible. Well, man, thanks so much for sharing these stories. I, oh, um, the yeah, this is a lot of fun. Let's, uh, let's finish off with our rapid fire questions. This, uh, sure. just a short list of questions and, and just share, uh, kind of the first thing that comes to mind. Yep. What's your favorite location to lead trips? Oh, well, that's a tough one. Uh, it'd be between Alaska and the Arctic rivers up there. I did the no attack once mm-hmm. and I would love to go back there and the Zerta winter river. It's an incredible river down there. No one knows about it. And, you know, hopefully one day between, outward bound and, mm-hmm. and maybe my company down there. I'd love to be able to turn people out of the Amazon down there. The Jordan River is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a national park and yeah, mm-hmm. national park with no infrastructure. So it's just, you know, right. Pristine just protected land. Yeah. Incredible. Awesome. All right. What's your favorite piece of gear that you, uh, you like to take on many trips or uh, you've had for a long time? <laughs> You know, it, it seems so blasé, but I love the little half liter water bottles. <laughs> Changed my life when I was working in Patagonia. I just yep. warmed my hands, got my hot drink right there. Yeah, I know it <laughs> sounds silly, but those little half liter Nalgene's, the old school ones. Yep. Yeah, they're still Baby Nalgene? Right yeah, baby Nalgene. <laughs> you know, that's the exact same thing that Roger Yim said. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I might have said the same thing if I was asked that question. Yeah. Sure. That's funny. Yeah, we were we were joking about how much uh um you know boiled water in those plastic bottles. I think it was long before they took out all the, the harmful chemicals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were using those. Exactly. Um, right on. Yeah, no, that that's a keepsake for sure. And obviously good for a hot drink. Yeah, um all right, best backcountry costume that you've uh, you've had on yourself or that you've seen someone else wear. <laughs> <laughs> well um i'm pretty sure it involves not a lot of clothing on my part all right <laughs> some some chuck taylors and a large sun hat and i'm probably gonna just have to call it right there <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> i think i'm afraid to hear that story wow and uh, chuck taylors is something you brought into the backcountry you know those were my- <laughs> your camp shoes those were, my, those were my wet shoes for a long time. I don't know why, because the canvas always ate away at the old ankle bones, but that was such an old school river shoe that I still had. It didn't give you any traction either. I don't know why we were into those. But <laughs> Was there a theme to that costume party? Oh, I'm sure there was, but uh, <laughs> come as you are. Anyway. Right. There you go. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think uh, one of my favorite uh, student costumes was and totally caught me off guard. We were in the Yukon and we had this costume party lined up. Everybody's getting geared up all day for Adelaide over day. Everybody's gearing out their costumes with whatever they got. And this one guy is from England and he comes super funny guy. It was an educator course. So really, really good humor. And uh, he's, he just comes with his wind pants on and no shirt. And like no one's going around with no shirt in that area. Cause it's just mosquitoes everywhere. Right. Yeah. And I was like, what, what are you like why didn't you get dressed up i thought you were you, you were talking about this costume all day and he's like no oh, i'm a premature ejaculation i, j- I just came <laughs> in my pants <laughs> i'll never forget it. <laughs> i was like you know you're in that instructor mode of like should I, am i can i laugh or or, or, should, or should I be upset or should I just walk I away? Reprimand. Yeah. And, you know, being an educator course with like much an older population, I, I think I just rolled to the ground laughing. <laughs> he had such a classic. sense of humor. That's great. Awesome. Okay. Just the last couple of quick questions. Okay. What image comes to mind when you hear the word adventure? Yeah. Um, yeah. To me, uh, really the Amazon is that place yeah. uh, for such of the unknowns, especially from that, that Roosevelt trip being you know, that first time in there, nothing replaces that, you know, that, that sense of like, I am just exploring. There are no guidebooks and we are just figuring it out as we go. And yeah. So yeah. probably that put in there will 
will be emblazoned in my mind there for a long time. Absolutely. All right, last one. If you could go back to any one location and share a hot drink with some friends in the field, where would it be and why? Well, it's the trip that never uh, got off the ground. Um, mm. It's Cape Horn. It was me, uh, oh. Jim Chisholm, and John Kempsey, and we got shut down by the Chilean Navy. And unfortunately, we didn't plan enough to have enough time to figure out different options. And at a certain point, we had to give up on it. And we had gotten all the stuff all the way down there. And, the, and, and so that trip, which was going to be a, just an epic amongst a couple of great friends in the back country of Patagonia, ended up being uh, still an interesting experience. <laughs> But not so you were going to paddle a kayak around Cape Horn? Is that what? Yeah, yeah, was? yeah. We were we were we were going to do the the paddle out from Puerto Williams and then down around the, the archipelago there. Yeah. So I'd love to go back there and have a hot yeah. drink with those guys. Yeah. But but this time be at one of those islands while we're waiting for a calm day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, there's no shortage of trips to do still That's to right. be done. You know, people right. talk to us because we've had some pretty unique experiences and done a lot of travel. And they're like, wow, is there any place you haven't been? Are you, <laughs> I'm just like, are you kidding me? There's so many. <laughs> it's a big world. So it many. is a big world. There's so yeah. many, there's, you know, endless lifetimes of, of great trips and exploration to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Tap Tap, the one said to me, we were mm -hmm. hanging out, you know, right out in front of El Coyote. He's like, mm -hmm. you know, that's what it's all about. You're always got your list of the 10 trips you're about to go do. All right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Heading out the door at any moment. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Wow. Awesome. Well, man, I'll tell you, this has been a real treat. It's been a pleasure having you on. I've really enjoyed your stories and uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep in touch. I look forward to uh, hearing some more stories someday. I know you've got many more uh, back in there and uh, if I get out to the West coast, uh, I'd love to connect sometime. Yeah, please do. And hey, thanks for the invite. Uh, yeah. I'm loving your your show, the podcast. So I'm cool. going to be keeping tabs on whoever the next one's coming yeah. up. Yeah, thanks awesome. Yeah, this will this will probably come out in in late May or so. But I'll, I'll send you a note when it comes out, and uh, you can share it around. Sounds great. Awesome. Well, you have a good night, and yeah, uh, we'll, we'll talk again soon. Yeah, take care. All bye right. Bye. Thanks. Now.